the the slight problem is well, a big problem is of course that it's not we're not driven by the pharmaceutical industry we're not driven by an industry which has lots of money so it's really it's been such a struggle to get to this point i mean i had my first paper published in 2012 or whatever and you know 10 years later where it's just beginning to take off but not really very little input from the national health service and this is kind of there's a quote from jonathan miller about his father's alzheimer's actually but in the way it's similar you know you get this brand new drug and everyone says oh that's amazing you know let's spend lots of money and that has virtually no effect but you know might have some effect but what really helped for his father was you know just having someone around all the time you know that it's the kind of human input that was really important it wasn't the, the flashy things it wasn't the machines that go ping it wasn't high-tech operations associated with it and you know and sadly he he himself died of alzheimer's afterwards and and this is the point you know and it's just awful you know, here rishi sunak you know potentially our next prime minister saying oh we'll solve all the problems in the health service with new tech that's what they get it but you just won't you know you've got these robot uh, machines doing prostatectomies which will get you out maybe get you out of hospital two days earlier and maybe uh, and in fact, uh, the long-term effects are no, re not really different for, uh, not really different. The long-term outcomes aren't really different with them. Whereas, you know, for the cost of one robot, you could fund the whole mental health swims program. You could fund swimming for pretty much everyone in the in the UK. And luckily, well, in the UK and England, maybe, fortunately, uh, the Scottish Parliament, I, I was contacted a few months ago by uh, Fulton McGregor, who's a, a Scottish MP, and he has set up a, so having a roundtable discussion about how we can turn this into a public health measure in Scotland in September, we're having another one sponsored by Scottish Swimming in March. So hopefully there's something enlightened coming out of this but yeah this is a really is a low cost and uh, and effective intervention yeah and okay maybe i'm biased and it's not as effective as i'd like to think it is but at the worst people are going out and getting some exercise there's one study as it's an old study but it, it's fascinating it shows that people who walked up the equivalent of three flights of stairs one once uh, every day every week they had measurably better cardiovascular health after you know a few years than those who didn't you know and okay you can you know, obviously do more exercises the better but you know just that act of driving down to the beach walking down the beach getting in the water walking back up the beach that's probably enough exercise to have some kind of cardiovascular benefit so you know you just can't go wrong with it and uh, and yeah, in terms of lifestyle medicine, this is Caroline. Uh, she's our poster girl. I like to think of her as our poster girl for the lifestyle medicine type uh, side of things. So she joined one of our courses. She actually helped set up the course in in so far as uh, recruiting patients and getting us funding. So we're very grateful to her. And but she joined the course herself and found that after a few months well a few months uh, just a few weeks of that she lost weight her high blood pressure came down she was no longer diabetic and yeah i mean i i love this thing you know i so i sent this picture so she, she's just completed a kilometer swim uh, on exmoor and mike sent me this picture of it say look at this you know look at caroline look how she's come along and uh I said, so I asked her, hey, do you mind if I show this picture in, in, you know, when I give talks? He thinks, yes, well, and she said, what I've written here, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't even deign to allow my photo to be taken. Uh, but, you know, she wants to convey that impact it can have on someone's mental and physical health, and therefore more than happy for you to share it widely. So this is the kind of effect you have. You know, it's not a pure cure. It's not a cure for uh, all the world's evils. Well, nearly all, but, you know, it's it's a fantastic thing and yeah and then you know again with this lifestyle medicine thing you know what we actually have now we don't have a national health service we have a national disease service and what i think cold water swimming can do you integrate that and it's so simple to integrate 
into the system, you might actually start mo moving towards a national health service. And I love this. This was spent sent to us spontaneously by Kirsty, who's uh, who's the model in this. And yeah, yeah, properly broken. And yeah, she was moved to send this to show what a difference five months had make of uh, of cold water swimming. And then you get to be like all those other people from our, our courses in Cornwall. So anyway, so that's why and how I ended up researching cold water swimming. And now you've got three slides on how to do it. Uh, so rule one, before you get in, know how you're going to get out. There's a, a, there's a book uh, edited by Paul Dickinson in the 80s, which uh, some of you might remember, called The Official Rules. Now, one of my favourites, I mean, it's just brilliant, but one of my favourites from this uh, was Agnes Allen's rule. And her rule is, it's almost, en almost always easier to get into something than out of. And that, I mean, that's true for the, all of life, and it's particularly true for cold water. So, you know, you've got to have your exit point before you get in. The second rule, warm up before you get in. It's best to go in, in warm. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff about, oh, if you, there's a bit of difference in the, you know, if the difference in temperature is that bad for you. The key thing is you want to have as much heat stored up in your system as possible before you get into that water so you don't become hypothermic. As I said, that is the really, there's a really key message to get across. Don't become hypothermic. Get your body in before your head. This is for a couple of reasons. One is the different uh, way your body feels. So the different system. So if you remember the body going into the water sets off a sympathetic response, whereas the face sets off a parasympathetic response. And there are rare, rare occasions where uh, stimulating both at the same time can set off heart arrhythmias. I mean, it's extremely rare, but it is possible. More crucially is before you're adapted, when you get into the water, you can't control your breathing. You take a really big, deep breath in and you hyperventilate. And if your head's under the water, that means you are filling your lungs full of water and not of air. And then once your lungs full of water, it's very difficult to get it out and get the air back in. So what you need to do is just get in long enough uh, to, um, to, I suppose, so you get in, you, you get that rush of pain and discomfort. I still get it after 20 years. I'm, I'm still a complete wuss when I go into the water. And you get that originally, but then you recombobulate, I like to think of it as. And and your breathing becomes calm and you just feel, yeah, you feel feel in a kind of more normal space. And when you've been in that long, I mean, you've probably been in long enough anyway to get the most of the benefits of the cold, but also at that point, it's safe to put your face into the water. Next thing is focus on your breathing. Again, people, if you're not particularly if you're not used to it, as I say, when you're first getting in, it's going to be really difficult to control you'll probably not be able to control your breath anyway but by focusing on your breathing you know it, it feels like a panic attack because basically that's what it is it's a really stressful situation you get in that water and you start hyperventilating it feels like a panic attack so focus on that breathing know that breathing is going to get better and know that you are going to recombobulate afterwards get out get out of the wind get dry get warm again you know you get hypothermia is your enemy and, you, and these are the ways to prevent it. The other thing is, if you've been in for a while, you might actually become hypothermic in the water, but you can experience this, the phenomenon known as after drop. And that, uh, that is where the sort of the cold from the outside starts kind of seeping into the inside. And so the less you cool down after you get out of the water, the better. And uh, finally, better together, swim with a friend. You know, it, one, for the safety, and two, because it's just so much more fun. You know, it's, and this is what keeps coming back for us from the course. It keeps you doing it as well. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, on those initial courses, well, I really didn't look forward to it. And that's the thing about getting in. It's, it's never that much fun. Well, maybe when it's in the middle of summer, as it is at the moment. But, yeah, it's never that much fun getting into the water. But <laughs> they all went down. yeah there's so many comments came back oh yeah but i wouldn't want to let the group down and things like this so it, it stimulates it motivates you to keep back and it brings that sense of community you know, reduces social isolation i mean that's another thing which is really important in terms of mental and physical health so the three corollaries to my six 
six rules. Uh, first is you don't have to be in the water that long. You know, it's you know, very much about dipping. Okay, you do a long swim, you get the exercise, but you don't get really any more benefit from the cold. So not that long. A few minutes is enough. And again, you know, certainly when it's really cold, you just need to be in for a minute or so, just enough time to recon recombobulate and then come back out. So I usually say, you know, go in for maybe three minutes, put your face in three times. And again, you, you wait for that initial sting, sting to pass, which is only a few seconds, rather than just taking your face straight out. That is all, all you need to do. It doesn't have to be that cold. I and mean, we've talked about cold water swing, but in fact, you see a really measurable physiological effect at water temperatures of less than 20 degrees centigrade. So that's really the maximum temperature you see in outdoor bodies of water around the UK all year round. So it, it, you don't need to be Wim Hof. You do not need to get in an ice bath. Just go for a swim in the summer in the sea. And you don't have to do it that often. In terms of adaptation, uh, I mean, the, the, just the, so the, the classic sort of adaptation experiments put people in maybe 10, 15 degree centigrade water and they put them in six times. And what they did was they found even after 40 months when the experiment ended, you know, they had a measurable 60% of their adaptation as measured by heart rate changes and things like that was still present. But I reckon if you manage once a week, I mean, less, but ideally say once a week, that is all you need to really uh, continue having a good effect. Because remember, it's not just about the adaptations, it's about getting your, your face in and you know, stim stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system and reducing inflammation. And if you want to reduce it down even further, four words, it's all about minimize discomfort maximize enjoyment and for me that means in the in the summer in the winter yeah when it goes below about 10 degrees i put on gloves and shoes yeah it, it just doesn't matter and i all nearly always wear a swimming hat you know really important yeah it's not about suffering it's uh yeah it's meant to be fun and so that's just about it um uh most of you should be aware of the book that i've written about this and you know so i go into a lot more detail about physiology about physics of water and things like this and i got uh is this the ultimate in backhanded compliments this was the the first review it came from my 19 year old son and his review was you must have had a really good editor oh well so at least something was good about it uh, and then uh, if you want to know more, I've got a website, hasn't got very much on it yet, but yeah, the plan is to make it into a resource with lots of stuff for uh, cold, water, you know, cold water swimming related. And you can see an occasional post on Instagram or Twitter if you'd like, at the Wild Swim Doctor. So thank you. And uh, I can now take questions. Brilliant. Well, we've got loads of questions coming in. So if you're ready, um, I'm just going to dive straight in. So um, first question, which a lot of people are asking is, is a shower or a bath a substitute for actually being in a fully immersed pool or sea and lake? Yes. Uh, short answer is yes, but not as is not as good. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the thing is with a shower, uh, yeah, and there is a study showing that uh, people who took cold showers had less days sick off work than their, uh, their, their other people at work in the office who didn't. So it does have an effect. But the thing is, what water gives you, the effect water gives you, uh, or the, the, the extent of the effect is dependent on two things. One is the absolute temperature of the water, and one is the rate of cooling. Now, a cold shower is like to come out around 20 degrees centigrade. So, so yeah, it's not that cold. I mean, it's cold enough, but it's not that cold. And the other thing is it doesn't cool you down as quickly as fully immersing yourself. So if you went into a bath, that would be better because you're immersing yourself in, in the water. You put a few bags of ice in, it's going to be colder. So that's going to have even more of an effect. But then you miss out on the community, the blue therapy, the green therapy, all, all that kind of stuff. So, yes, they do have an effect. And yes, even cold showers have had a measurable effect, mm. but it's not as much of an effect. And interesting, you know, the same, same applies to wetsuits. You know, you wear a wetsuit, you're still getting in the water, still getting the exercise and things like that. But it's just not as effective. Okay. But it is effective. Um, and you've said there already that wearing a wetsuit 
it is fine to do, but it does slightly minimize the benefits as well. Someone else was asking that. Um, and some people are asking if you should aim to build up the amount of time you're spending in cold water when you're swimming. Well, I think that's kind of, that's what I'm kind of convey with the, uh, the three corollaries. So it doesn't have to be that long. I don't think you really do. I mean, okay. I have no scientific evidence for this, but, you know, certainly I have a lot of my own experience of it. And, you know, I think, you know, once you got in, once you got past that initial thing and, you know, you've got had most of the effect, it, it really doesn't have to be a long, you know, stay in because you're enjoying it. Don't stay in for ages. Don't stay in so long you become hypothermic. Certainly when I started that, I couldn't, I mean, I, I can't tell you how I know it now, but I, I was often in the winter, I'd sort of be having fun, you know, lots of waves, playing around in the waves. I come in and I get a lot of afterdrop and it's just unpleasant. And you're not going to get any further benefit from that. And in fact, that's where you're like, do you, I mean, you're where you're like more likely to do yourself some harm. I mean, harm in inverted commas, it's not a, uh, not a big harm. So I think it's important not to aim to stay in too long, stay in as long, work out how long it feels good. And when you're coming out, you know, notice, oh, yeah, I feel a bit bit shivery afterwards, you know, then you've been in too long. One good sign of when it's time to get out is the, the so-called claw hand effect. So what happens okay. is the muscles in your hand become, stop working relatively early. And so when you can't bring your hands together, you can't bring your fingers together. So it's kind of more like a claw. Mm -hmm. and. And at that point, that's a really good sign. It's, you're still totally safe at this point. And that's a good sign that you should think about, about going back in. And that's, that's long enough. Okay. Um, some people just want to double check. So um, have you done any research looking at people who've done cold swimming in an asocial environment, potentially indoors? So how do you differentiate between the benefits gained from swimming and those that simply come from spending time outdoors and being with people and being social? um we don't i mean mm. that's the point as kind of what i was saying earlier you know we could have done that we could have separated out those benefits and but i think it was better you know we start at the top start uh, work our way down uh from the top you know does it work you know are people interested you know with the, with the courses in Denver, we thought well will people turn up yeah, we didn't even know if mm. anyone would sign up to it and then well if they turn up will they come back week after week and I think we need to do that before we start looking at those individual aspects. Although, interestingly, there was just this week, I, I came across a, a newly published paper which differentiated between the effects of the cold and the exercise. And they found that the cold itself had a significant effect. It isn't just the exercise. But all the other bits, you know, I'm sure that the cold has its own unique benefits but and all the others are are tag-ons but you know to my mind i'd love to know know that the answer to that question but i'm more mm. bothered about just getting people out there yeah you know, we're really getting good evidence that it does work and then how do we get people out there and what does it work for and how do we run these courses best how do we get it out to people best mm. um a couple of questions about breath work and changing breathing patterns which obviously comes from swimming and some other people are also asking about if you use a different breathing technique before you immerse yourself in the water could you say anything about that please i can say a little about that but not very much and mike morris who runs a course in chill has he's got in a, a breath coach you know breath work is a really good idea it's a really good thing you know and uh, in fact i mean I do. You know, I've read, uh, it was James Nestor's book, Breath. And I read that. I was motivated to start uh, doing, he's just got an app. It's just, a, you breathe in for six seconds, you breathe out for six seconds. And yeah, you know, I find it just phenomenally helpful. Mm -hmm. So breathing is good. Breath work is good. And so there's, but uh, I, yeah, I haven't got any specific techniques. I know Wim Hof, he uses a version of um, Tumo breathing, which is uh, inner fire breathing, you know, Tibetan uh, technique. That, yeah, I mean, if you find it useful, you can do it, but I haven't, I've never done it. We do more about just the kind of more regular breathing or focus on the breathing and, you know, simply a you know, really simple stuff, you know, feeling control feeling in control type 
breathing is all we've looked at but yeah as i say breath work is a good thing uh i'm not sure yeah and the tumo might work for you i haven't tried it myself and i've survived a few winters so <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, that's unfortunately all we've got time for, but it sounds like there's loads more that you cover in the book. And also I'm sure there'll be loads more of research that you're coming up with over the next few years. So you'll want to definitely following and keep track of if we're all interested in this. But um, thank you so much for joining us to share this. It's been really interesting to listen to. And I have to admit, it's just made me really want to go for a swim. <laughs> that's that's the ultimate thing. I mean, and that was it. it was with my 19 year old son. That, you know, so he gave me that backhanded review, but he did start swimming in the cold water. Oh, I know. Oh, if only I didn't live in London, I have to find a lie down. Uh, London, Parliament Hill, Brock Hill. That's true. Uh, exactly. Uh, Parliament Hill Ponds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Mark, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you, everyone, for so many questions. It's great to see lots of you tuning in. But thanks, Mark, and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much.